Hello, everyone. At the beginning of every <laughs> every entrepreneur's kitchen, that's the uh, you know that's the good OBS trick. Thank you. Well, um, hey guys, how are you doing? Uh, welcome to uh, at another episode of the entrepreneur's kitchen um i stopped counting i think this is over the um, 20 21st episode um and i'm really really happy uh to be hosting william alexander tonight um i would like to introduce him to you um just briefly uh william is the head of uh global one of the leaders of global practices uh for uh, executive search in telecoms media and um and what telecom media and technology companies <laughs> exactly telecom media and technology companies at uh, over at spencer stewart uh please welcome with me you have already heard the sound hey william how are you i'm well good to see you Sarah. good evening Good evening. Good to see you too. So you still have some light. Uh, you know, it's not dark evening yet. There, <laughs> awesome. is, there is light in London. Yes. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm really happy that you're joining me tonight at the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. I would like to discuss with you the topics around leadership, around cultural transformation, those topics seem to be more pressing than ever. Uh, we will also talk about, you know, um, some of the qualities and um, of, of, you know, the new kinds of executives and board members uh, in, in times of crisis. I'm looking forward to that discussion. Plus, we will be cooking and cracking jokes. So let's start with the cooking part. Three ingredients. Was it hard to find something? I went for the easiest possible recipe I could do, and it's the one that I do many mornings for my daughter. Uh, it's, it involves a small bit of butter, uh, two eggs, and one banana, and I'm going to be making banana pancakes. It will probably be two, maybe three banana pancakes during awesome. the next time. <laughs> you know, I also, I also, in, I think in one of the episodes, I did the banana pancakes too, but I was using flavor and also some vanilla. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> this is the natural banana pancakes au naturel. Oh, that's awesome. I love, I love them. My kids love them too. They're, they're very good. And you can put all sorts of toppings on them. Uh, and I'm going for a def different direction. Um, it's, you know, I'm Turkish. And uh, there is always this discussion, whom does it really belong? Tatsiki. And we Turks call it Jajik. Uh, it's, you know, uh, garlic yogurt with uh, some cucumbers um, in it. And you can just use it with meat dishes and anything, you know, you would like. And, uh, and it's also a great dip. So if you're, uh, you know, having just some bread or some uh, chips, you can, I will be grating. So if you hear like, <laughs> no worries. I'm very disappointed that you're not doing that Turkish uh, sweet dish, which is <gasps> yeah. Bastard of Istanbul. Uh, have you read the Bastard of Istanbul? Uh, Elif Shafrik, and she does this. I can't remember the name of it, but it's got so many ingredients and each chapter begins with it is titled with one of the ingredients oh, in the okay no i don't know the book i should check it out <laughs> it's awesome a yeah i well, you know elif shafak is definitely very very famous in in uh, turkey yeah cool so yeah we have very big elaborate uh, sweets with just way too many ingredients <laughs> and then you eat just a tiny bit and you're full um i mean if you're used to them um well you know, William, um, while we're preparing our food, I really want to talk about, um, you know, tonight's topic. Um, I want to just um, give it a kickstart uh, with asking you a question. I mean, the reason why I invited you today is, uh, as I said, we're going through really um, difficult times in terms of leadership practices. Um, and I value, I cherish your opinion on this topic in general. We had a, a very interesting, nice discussion, uh, you know, last summer when we had the time here to sit at the terrace in Salzburg and, and you know, be together, actually. Um, so what do you think is one of the major things that is going to be changing after this crisis and through this crisis? 
Well, I, I mean, we were we were chatting earlier a little bit, and I, I do think that we, some of our assumptions about when we need to be with people physically versus digital is going to change. And someone said, for all the digital transformation officers, chief digital officers that have been appointed to try and help companies become mm. digital, COVID-19 might actually be the one that does more than any of them. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, it's a terrible thing to say because of the, obviously the, the human consequences of it, but mm. it is forcing businesses and leaders to mm. think in a very different way about how they run their businesses. Actually, I remember seeing a cartoon where it says, who is dri driving digital transformation in your company? CEO, CDO, and COVID-19. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but I suppose that, you know, the fundamentals don't change so much. And while I'm answering this, I ought to just, <laughs> what I'm going to do is push on the banana. I don't know if you do this, but I, I ah. push the banana down rather than having to squeeze it with a fork. In fact, ah. I need a fork. And that's actually very clever to do. Yeah, excellent. And then it's much easier to mush it up with the fork afterwards. So that's my advice. <laughs> Lovely. But, Look, um, I'm also prepping here the cucumber. You have to, you know, okay. peel it. Yeah. The other, the other point to make is when you peel a banana, <laughs> which way do you do it? Do you do it from this bit? Do you, do you peel it from the yeah, top? Yeah, I do that. Yeah. It's much easier. This is one thing. Monkeys, if you see monkeys, they peel their banana from this end. And it's much, much easier to peel that way. Humans, we don't do it. We use the, the stalk and the monkeys, they do it from that end. I learned that one time. That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, well, do you know why we do it like that? Uh, versus to, because we want to differentiate, right? <laughs> we want to um, differentiate. Yeah. Anyway, change, change management. People often yeah. talk about peeling a banana and changing your habit on peeling a banana is a good example for changing the way you lead. But I think the fundamentals of leadership actually don't change at all um, mm. because when, uh, you know, when we think about leadership it, it, at the highest level it's very very straightforward you've got stuff going on in the outside world you've got a context you've got an environment that's out there mm -hmm. and you want to produce outcomes and the leader's role is to get from this context the outside environment, what's there in the business, to get from that down to the outcomes which they want to deliver. Mm -hmm. And we often say that, that leaders mess up or get fired for, for two basic reasons. One is because they misinterpret what's going on, the content. <laughs> mm -hmm. The other is they get that absolutely right, but they can't make it happen and they don't get the outcomes. They don't mm -hmm. execute, they don't deliver correctly. Mm -hmm. And, and what we say you know, in normal times is there are three main elements to getting from the context, interpreting it down to the outcomes. One is real clarity, clarity on where are we going to, what's our purpose, what are we about, what's the vision, what's the strategy that's going to get us there, what are the, the, mm -hmm. the resources. So that's number one, clarity. The second one is then aligning all the resources. You've got to design the structure, you've got to get the right people in the right roles, get mm. the right financing, the right technology, the right vendors to support you. So there's the, the, the aligning. And then the third element is you've got to create energy. You've got to get people doing things, motivated, engaged, excited. Mm. You've got to manage your own energy. And if you work through those three, clarity, alignment, engagement, and keep them coherent and keep going back and forth, usually you get the performance and the outcomes that you want. If we look at it in this situation in COVID-19, well, suddenly the clarity that you had mm -hmm. has been dealt a sharp blow because if you're in the travel industry, all your assumptions, all your plans have gone to, 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 yeah. to, to high water um, yeah. in any sector you're rethinking. So that, that new thinking has to be done. Mm -hmm. Secondly, on the aligning, some of your resources aren't there. People yeah. get ill. People aren't in the office. The ways you've done things, the way you've structured things has changed. And energy, energy is often in meetings, physical meetings, going up to people, going to their office. Suddenly you've got mm -hmm. to do it all in this remote way. So all your assumptions on how you get the clarity, the alignment of resources and the structures and the energy in your organization have, have, have got to be thought about in new ways. Yeah, but I mean, um, so 
there, there are for me two questions that come out of this on the one hand it's like um now it's one of the most important things that um uh you know that people actually have uh under people must understand that the outcomes are just a necessary result of all those other things um if, if you're doing all those other aspects right then the outcome is just you know a necessary result a byproduct so to speak <laughs> is it well, or, or how do you see that well, that's, that's the challenge you see but you know i'd say most leaders maybe every leader gets frustrated mm -hmm. because they get their clear plan and actually the outcomes don't happen as you say mm -hmm. Things take longer, it's much more bumpy than they expect. And actually, you can't do it without cracking an egg. To make an omelet, you have to crack an egg. So I'm just going to crack my, one of my eggs. Yeah. And, and in the meantime, in the meantime, I should also mention uh, to the people who are watching, there will be a lot of very interesting topics we're going to be touching upon. So if you guys have any questions for uh, William Alexander, uh, who is the global uh, leader, uh, one of the leaders um, at uh, Spencer Stewart for media technology and telecoms companies, uh, just tune in to Twitter uh, and use the hashtag the Mindshift TV uh, and just ask him anything also about the pancakes <laughs> yeah so back back to why leaders get frustrated <laughs> two, two two critical realities that get missed one is that the levers that leaders tend to focus on particularly new leaders mm -hmm. are the more tangible visible ones so they put in place the strategy they put in place the organization structure they mm. put in place the rewards, the, the, the incentive systems, these sorts of things. They, they, they get the rights. They look at the careers of people, what they've done, and they put them in their teams. But the challenge is that what really gets in the way is all the stuff which is under the surface that's less yeah. visible. There's sorts of things you work on with, with mind, mind shift. Yeah. You know, the, the, at the organizational level, it's the culture, it's the behaviors. At the individual level, it's the personality. Mm. And if you... COVID-19, it, it's exacerbated because some people, some leaders are very safety focused. Other leaders are very optimistic, very creative. Mm -hmm. If you're in a meeting and you've got COVID-19 going on and you've got your very risk averse, safety oriented leader, it's going to be exacerbated yeah. three, four times in yeah. this situation. And there's going to be much more liability for tension and lack of effectiveness within mm -hmm. that topic. So that's one critical reality that the the key levers are actually a little more hidden. They're under the surface. The second one is people often do projects on strategy or they do projects on compensation and benefits for incentives, or they do projects on culture. Mm -hmm. What's so important is that they're all linked together yeah. and you work on it as a single system. And often that doesn't happen. So they give the CHRO the culture project yeah. and they give their finance person the rewards and it doesn't link together. And in most cases, CHRO, isn't even one of the executive topics uh you know it's like its own department and uh, uh the the other c roles are the ones that are uh, more like in the executive execution oriented and and uh, hr is being treated you know as as if it's a uh, nice to have <laughs> that's another that's a really intriguing aspect of covid 19. Yeah. in the he was talking to a client in the travel industry and they had their senior leadership team meeting, so CEO, CFO, CHRO, COO, CMO, all, all the team together. And they had some very difficult decisions to be making. Mm -hmm. And the person in this company who is a bit more dominant and very logical was actually, I mean, it was the CFO. Mm -hmm. They were dominating this discussion about some very important decisions to be made. And the CHRO came out of that meeting and reflected and felt very uncomfortable mm. with logical, financially driven decisions that have been made in this environment. Mm -hmm. And he reflected for a while and he called the CEO and said, I, I just want to say, I've been reflecting on what we've decided as a senior leadership team. I just don't feel it's right. I don't feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. CEO talked to him, listened, they then got the CFO and the COO back and they had another discussion and they reversed 
the decisions ah. that they made. They got the, the senior leadership team back together mm -hmm. and they were the decision. So actually, the chief human resources, the chief people person in this environment, I think, has to step up mm -hmm. if the right sort of decisions are going to be made. And, and it's what we always talk about in, in cultures, you know, diversity, diversity of thinking. If mm -hmm. you've got something being driven by the finance guy and the alpha CEO, you know, you, you're going to have challenges happening and wrong decisions being taken for the sustainability of the business. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about, you know, particularly this uh, uh, situation like, the, you know, now we have, we suddenly have the health risk. When when I was attending corporate governance forums uh, a couple of months ago, number one priority was all around, you know, environmental risks, sustainability, change of business models in, you know, more like if you're into automotive, of course, you know, the discussion is clear. And um, people were not even thinking in their dreams about a situation like this, where you can't suddenly use your office, uh, you have to, you know, uh, a lot of people are being driven out of business. Um, so can one actually, in terms of leadership, prepare something like this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really intriguing. I remember a chat from one of the big mining companies mm -hmm. talked about how every board meeting started on the topic of health and safety. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it. I'm in tech and telecom. And yeah, of course you think about health and safety, but it's not really right at the top of your, uh, mm -hmm. of your agenda. So I think some companies like the mining industry, perhaps the oil industry, you know, they've had that right at the top of their, their mind for a while. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right that our, our leader at Spencer Stewart I think has been pretty good in terms of responding to the crisis and with the leadership team of Spencer Stewart and setting out the four pillars that are going to guide us through this period mm -hmm. with number one being the health and safety of colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, Spencer Stewart. And then number two is continuing to serve our clients. And number three, now I've forgotten the pillars, but, uh, but it's interesting. <laughs> that be, you never have thought that that would be number one yeah. Uh, advisory firm. Absolutely, and um, and what, in your opinion, uh, is you know one top quality? Um, if you're doing searches now, are, are you still doing searches in this environment actively? Are people actually hiring still? <laughs> I'm just wondering if I put a bit too much in there, but I think. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's okay. Yeah, I'm almost done here. It's really, it's it's a very easy issue to. Of banana pancakes. The yeah. issue of banana pancakes. Is if you put too much in, you can't you can't flip it. It's too soft. Oh. On the <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. You know the good thing about the, this show is that only you get to eat what you cooked. <laughs> well, we've got a dog now. We have a puppy, a COVID nineteen puppy. So that's also an opportunity here. Well, I don't know whether that egg is good for puppies. You'll have to. I'll no, have to I that. think bananas are okay. Eggs are okay too. Butter might be slightly. Well, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Try it, try it out, and then you'll see. <laughs> Sorry, remind me of the question you were, oh, are, are projects still happening? Y yes, they are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some companies are wondering, are they going to get the best possible people to move in mm -hmm. this environment? They feel a duty mm -hmm. to their current organization and their current team. Um, but for, I mean, I've had two projects, maybe three projects that have started just this week. Ah. Because They've got a CEO who's either not wanting to carry on or they're failing in the job mm -hmm. and such an opportunity cost of making, not making that change. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they'll be able to go all the way through, hopefully. We've just done a major CEO role actually in the US. Um, I think it's public. Uh, yeah. If it's not, then please, everybody on this stream treat it as confidential. But I'm pretty sure um, it's been announced now, which is the eBay uh, CEO appointment. And some of those... Um, meetings at the end were actually done, you know, board members couldn't meet physically. It all had to be done virtually. So a major business is making a change in their top leader through virtual virtual meetings. Uh, that's really great. Uh, you have a question already on uh, the Mindshift TV on Twitter. So if you guys have any um, questions, just shoot them. Um, William, why is clarity so important for leadership? Why is what? Clarity. Uh Clarity, because um, it's a little bit like, I think it's a bit like in our individual lives, actually, that w what is it that gets us 
stressed, anxious, frustrated. It's when we don't really know where we're going with our life. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same in businesses that when there isn't that feeling of this is what we're about, this is the destination, this is the strategy. It makes all the other decisions much, much more difficult. Um, I can't remember the person who talks about uh, True North. Mm -hmm. Until you've got that clarity, all the other decisions that need to get made become much more complicated and much more likely to be driven by individuals' agendas or individual teams' agendas mm -hmm. than if there's absolute clarity on what this business is about and where it's going. But, I mean, can you really be 100% clear on topics if there is so much ambiguity? So what, is, what does this clarity apply to? Well, and that's why I think, I mean, in the science of Time and Cynic, he talks about the power of why. Hmm. You know, you've got to keep going to the core of why you are as a business. Mm -hmm. because then that allows you to react to what's going on. Absolutely, you can't be clear and then stick and put it all into clay. You've got to be clear, you've got to know what you're about. And then as different things happen in the outside world, in your organization, you're much more able to react quickly and be agile because you've got the clarity of what the purpose is and the destination. And what would you say, how important it is to be aligned with your you know, company's purpose uh, versus personal purpose? And what do you do if you seem that to, to be shifting apart. Look, hey! <laughs> yeah, I still have some. I still have some beauty, uh, beauty things uh, to do here. But mine. Well, got more to do, I think. But I just wanted to show you because it's much better than I expected it to be. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure that the taste is really good. Um, so, how much? What can you have if your individual purpose doesn't tie with the company purpose? Then yeah, or you know, you start out and and um, you believe that certain things um, were aligned, but then with, within time, you know, how do you how do you weigh it back and forth all the time? I think it's actually a problem if you feel your individual purpose doesn't tie with what your company is about. You're not going to be as happy or as engaged or as effective as if your individual purpose you can you can see that it ties in with your company purpose mm -hmm. uh, now within a company there's lots of different roles and so you might find your individual purpose doing something within a company that isn't some grandiose purpose like spencer stewart which is all about discovering and developing leadership for a better future mm -hmm. you, you might be fixing the i don't know the, the laptops or, or something, and you're, you're not sure that's there, but it, 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 you know, really it should fit within the overall purpose if you're going to have, feel engaged and, and happy in life. Um, yeah, but I mean, when, when we think about um, also, I've been interviewing, uh, you know, chatting with so many um, business leaders in the last couple of weeks, and um, it's really interesting because a lot of people have been saying, Nobody, you know, nobody was thinking about such a crisis like this one, but we can't, uh, we can't go back to business as usual, so things will have to change. Um, yes, but then, on the other hand, we have, you know, companies that are built on, which are really now coming up to surface, built on exploitation, artificial scarcity, uh, you know, production, overproduction, um, and suddenly people are really in this dilemma situation uh, where on the one hand, you want to be at the top. <laughs> on the other hand, it's so difficult to let go. Um, so how, how do you deal with this? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I mean, I do think that this environment is going to push people, business people, leaders to really think about how do they feel doing what they're doing when you're at home with your partner, with your family for so long in the garden. I think people will be thinking about how, is this right for them? Mm. Is it what they want to be doing? Now, how it all turns out into terms of, will we still be 
jetting off for holidays to the Caribbean, not that I do that, but jetting off to holidays for the Caribbean <laughs> for a weekend, or yeah. will it change our mindset? I just don't know. I would think that mm. for some of it will change our mindsets for a while. I don't know how long it will change our mindsets for, but it will change them for a while. And do you think that it's going to be very soon that we go back to our offices? Or what do you think about, you know, meeting online and having all those uh, sessions? Will that, will that just keep going? I mean, someone asked me about this earlier today, and I, they were saying, uh, when do you think we'll be back in the office? I, I do think people who have horrible commutes on mm. the ground trains and crowded buses are loving the fact that they've been <laughs> given two hours of their life back a day mm. in, in a, a nice environment. Um, and I think people will work from home more. Mm. Equally, there are people who are saying, I wish I could be back in the office and having you know, lunch with friends, colleagues again. So I think it will adjust the equilibrium, mm. but it's not suddenly going to be all remote work, it's definitely not. Mm. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, uh, we, in the preparation discussion, uh, you were telling me that it's also uh, not that bad to be facilitating some of the uh, sessions that people usually do, like workshops uh, together, um, and, and facilitating them online. It's, uh, uh, so you had some really good experience with that. So does that really work? Can people still uh, you know, be buddies and uh, kind of... Uh, synchronize in a way like in the analog world yeah no i was i was skeptical actually that because we're doing some team effectiveness sessions mm -hmm. that are halfway through and i was skeptical that we could work it mm. virtually but of course the, the virtual environment does give opportunities as well so i mean the the the, the, the slightly tactical aspect of how do you do breakout groups well actually mm -hmm. breakout groups on Zoom or Blue Jeans or Microsoft Teams work perfectly well. You can have two people go off and have a chat, then you come back as a, yeah. as a, as a session, as a group of 12, 15. We've had, I mean, like many companies, we've had town halls with 2,000 people on. What becomes mm -hmm. important is these other mechanisms like the chats that you're using here. Mm -hmm. There's things like whiteboards. There's things like the uh, word clouds by voting, which can be very visual ways. In some ways, you know, more engaging ways than you get when you're in a room of 2,000 people feeling a bit hot and, and hemmed yeah. in. <laughs> uh, and, and in fact, one of our town halls with our, our CEO at Spencer Stewart, I think people found it really quite moving. And, you know, the chat, mm -hmm. there were a lot of Americans, so it was quite, you know, hearts opening out. But such pride and real um, willing to share how mm -hmm. they feel about it. And you see it, you know, popping up on the chat side of the, the screen. Yeah, so it's like, um, do you think that this enthusiasm can just go away and people are like, now we don't want this anymore, we want to go back? Well, certainly people, are, it's, I mean, I'm talking about Spencer Stewart because it's the one experience I've got absolutely directly and I'm feeling it. Um, certainly people have said that the way that we've reacted to the crisis has made them so much more proud of where they are and realize what it mm. is they have in the company and the gratitude and mm. all that. I mean, we're only a 2,000 person company, but still that's enough people where you don't know people, but there's yeah. a, a real sort of sense of, of trust that's been built through this. That's awesome. Um, let's go back to the topic of uh, leadership. Um, so, I, you know, what? why I find it really uh, um, kind of tricky to pronounce when, when I'm telling your uh, job title at Spencer Stewart is because now I started to think of every company as a technology company. <laughs> so, so I'm always inclined to say he is the leader, uh, global practice leader for technology companies, but it's like media and telecoms. <laughs> um, so in, in, when we think about technology companies and leadership practice there, um, what do you think are some of the most important cultural aspects people should be aware of uh, when, when you know, thinking about transformation projects, thinking about what's going to come in the future, also dealing with crisis situations? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm just trying to think of what might be particularly relevant for technology 
companies. I mean, the, the good news is that most technology companies are quite au fait with digital ways of doing things. They've, they've developed that already. I mean, it's interesting. I'm coaching um, the top team and CEO and top team of a, of a telecom business, an incumbent telecom business. And of course, there is not so related to your technology message, but, but for them, they felt like they're such a critical infrastructure to have mm -hmm. the broadband communication. And if they're too many of their engineers can't work, mm -hmm. what are they going to do when there's a problem? And if the broadband goes down, how will the country react? You know, it mm -hmm. becomes, a, it's almost like water, heating and, and, and broadband is the, the, the three essentials. <laughs> and, Absolutely. That was weighing on this CEO and this CEO is a particularly caring CEO, and he was he was really uh, struggling with does he ask um, some of his employees to separate from their families to isolate self isolate so that they definitely will be healthy enough mm -hmm. to keep that infrastructure up? You know, you have the AB teams and things like that, and it was a real mm -hmm. problem for him because he felt he felt that he you know felt guilty about asking them to separate from their families. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are so many other professions like in the medical world where so many people are separating from their families because they're in mm -hmm. at the front line in hospitals. So it was, but, but for him, it was felt like a really difficult decision. Just on your tech point, I'm not sure that there's anything particular about technology. Maybe things move faster, but as you say, every industry is so driven by technology now, they're all having to become more agile and react more quickly. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and also, you know, one of the things I know about you, oh, you disappeared. <laughs> Well, you know, actually, I had a magician on the program, ah. <laughs> and he did all these tricks, and uh, and and we had two different dates, and in the first date, he couldn't make it because of a family emergency, <laughs> so he was like, "I have to disappear." So, uh, look, here's, well, a mango, here's a mango seed, and look, it's uh, gone. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, doing magic on, uh, you know, on the internet via screaming. Easy. <laughs> kind of. Well, um, well, but a different kind of magic is the magic that actually happens in your brain. And I know um, as a private person that you're very much into mindfulness practices. Um, so let's talk about that. Why do you, why did you go to mindfulness yourself in the first place and how does it actually affect, uh, um, you know, your work and, and your, uh, influence on, on, um, your mantis? I mean, I'm not sure that I'm really at the, you know, upper quartile of mindful, mindfulness people. I mean, what, what is important to me? I do like my routines in the day. So I tend to, I'm a, I'm a morning, a morning lark as opposed to a night owl. I like to get up early. So this is very late for me now. What are we with past? <laughs> um, but I do like to get up early. I do love to do half an hour, 40 minutes of yoga. I do it with Adrienne on YouTube, who's fantastic for anybody oh, who hasn't okay. used Adrienne yet. I highly recommend her. She's in, based in Austin, Texas. There's a thousands of videos you can choose from all sorts of um, lengths of time. So I do that. And then typically I'd have breakfast, make the banana pancakes for the family, <laughs> have breakfast, and then run or cycle into work. And those routines actually are, are wonderful for me. It sets the day with a mm -hmm. nice grounding, a nice, a nice platform. And obviously in the yoga, you, you really want to try and get all the thoughts out of your mind. And that, that's good. With the running or the cycling to work obviously there's lots of often there's lots of thoughts happening um but that for me is the core and then i'd cycle or, or run home from work typically and i'm missing that that's one of the problems of covid19 that i haven't got my commute through the parks uh, uh, mm -hmm. running at the moment but i think you know more broadly just taking time giving yourself space is so important just that's when the thoughts come together, the different parts come together. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a master of 30 minutes meditation. It can mm -hmm. just be laughing and playing, taking the dog for a walk or being with, uh, with friends, mm -hmm. just getting the brain off the topic 
which it's perhaps grappling with, allows some of the connections mm. to happen. In the same way, I know we're going to tell a joke in a moment, but I'm a great believer that laughter, humor, in parallel to difficult issues and difficult moments, is an enormous help to, mm. to through. Um, and for allowing yourself to see connections between things. You know, I uh, in, in our practice, every now and then we um, encounter, you know, meetings and also executive people um, who deliberately say that they're having difficulties switching off. Um, I'm assuming in your practice, it's also not going to be much more different than that because there's so much pressure. Um, so, you know, how can, I mean, on, for us, it's easy to say, right? Do this, do that. But if you're really under so much pressure, how can you uh, truly switch off? I think, I think the best leaders form a habit of doing it. I'm working with a, with a leader yeah. of a UK company, and mm -hmm. he is very strict on how he organizes his time and mm -hmm. very good at saying no to mm -hmm. meeting. I mean, that's one of the key talents for a leader is knowing how to say no to things, mm -hmm. particularly in today's environment with, you know, again, with COVID-19, you've got all your priorities already there. And there's such a pressure for you to get involved in lots and lots of decisions, which seem urgent mm -hmm. and essential for you to be there. But actually, you've got to keep that same clarity on where do you bring the most value? Where do you and only you need to be involved and leave it to others to make the decisions that don't actually need you and give yourself space yeah. to keep going around on these aspects of clarity on what we're about mm -hmm. have i got the right resources in the right places is there the right level of engagement and energy in, in my organization what do i need to do mm -hmm. and also have i got the right sort of energy for myself am i taking time to reflect to breathe and be able to have the, the, the fitness when it comes to the key decisions that need to be made. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because when we think about a lot of the uh, uh, you know, top level people who, are, who seem to be, uh, uh, I mean, most of them seem to be really conscious about what they eat, what, whether they also do their you know, uh, um, uh, sports practices. But on the other hand, a lot of people seem to be like control freaks. Um, there is oftentimes an atmosphere of fear uh, in companies, um, you know, because, because there are things at stake. Um, and how can you create a balance between you make sure that the stuff is going on as it should be going on, the effectiveness and, you know, the productivity is at the place. On the other hand, uh, you take yourself out of the, you know, administrative uh, decision making and really focus on, as you've said, you know, the things that are crucial that you decide about them. Um, I sometimes think about, you know, um, like a good CEO is probably more like a person who thinks more entrepreneurial rather than, you know, puzzles about, around managing and putting up systems and, you know, processes, controlling them. Well, I, I'm going. I'm going. I'm probably going to misquote this, but I think <laughs> people used to say that that at Microsoft, Bill Gates was always the smartest person in the room. <laughs> and they say about Satya Nadella hmm. that he made sure he always has the smartest people in the room for the particular. <laughs> and I think that's part of what the, you know great leadership is: is not trying to be the smartest person in the organization but to be the person who aligns, who orchestrates, who gets the smartest people on the toughest issues and on the issues that are right for their smarts. Mm. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I really like your point, but I'm, uh, unfortunately, I see a lot of differences between practice <laughs> and, yeah. you know. <laughs> but I think it's learning also. Yeah. I, think the, I think the leaders who are sustainable who can go on for 10 years, 15 years as a CEO, they do get it. I think the mm -hmm. leaders, you know, the average tenure of a CEO is something like four and a half years. What goes wrong? They can't delegate. They can't get the right resources mm -hmm. around. They don't focus on what's most important. They don't focus on the things that are under the surface, 
the cultural aspects, building trust, building effective teams, thinking about the characters of the people, not just what they've done. That, that, that's why people don't last as CEOs because they can't get that. Mm-hmm. That's why well, some of them. Actually, there is another question on Twitter. Uh, it says, uh, William, is COVID-19 going to have an impact on equality at the workplace? Mm, interesting. Mm. Well, I mean, it, 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 we should think about different angles on that. Um, I mean, certainly if you think about disabled people, you know, physically disabled people, actually with remote working becoming much more normal, well, very normal, <laughs> the only mm-hmm. way, um, you know, does that help physically disabled people? Mm-hmm. I think the, you know, the, 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 the chief uh, care person at home, the parent, uh, the, the, what is it, the, um, what's it called? The yeah, person who, the, the person, not the caretaker, the person who's looking after the kids most, the, 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 oh, the, the, the yeah, well. responsibility, you know, by having remote working more mm-hmm. acceptable and that help the chief caregiver at home be, be actually more involved at work mm-hmm. because of flexibility. They don't have to travel in from 7 a.m. in the morning yeah. until... 7 a.m., 7 p.m. at night. Mm. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe this plague, this version of humanity's plague, cr- brings back a sense of humanity to mm. people, uh, a recognition that uh, we should be empathetic, understand each other more, and this sense of equality. It, you know, it pays no respect for whether someone is president or prime minister or, or mm. whatever. Maybe. In my idealistic way, I'd like to say yes, but in my um, <laughs> try and you know soften that, maybe we go back to normal. But who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I well, mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned already that um, also humor is a very important uh, part of uh, you know the the work life uh, and and whatever. Do you do you actually? use the term work-life balance at all i don't like that very much <laughs> i hate it I, I was part of a task force at spencer stewart on work-life balance and I, I changed it to just say you know what is this about it's about having a fulfilled life at work yeah. at home and wherever else we like to be yeah. and that's what it's about because life is in work and life is you know life is everywhere it's not life and work Life is yeah, fun. it's 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 kind of difficult. Absolutely, I mean, we're we're of course really privileged to be doing things that kind of uh, fulfill us. That they that help us self actualize. I wish every human being on the planet would be able to, uh, you know, do these things that seem like a privilege in today's world. But uh, it just should be actually the new new normal. Um, let's. You know, since we're getting close to the end of the show, <laughs> I would like to ask you for a joke. <laughs> a joke, a joke. <laughs> well, I'm going to do a joke that I st- I'm stealing from a TED lecture, actually, a TED talk. Oh, talk. good. So, so I hope I don't, because this might go on YouTube and things, I hope I don't get prosecuted for stealing. Oh, no. Stuff. But I liked it very much because it's, I think it's very um, culturally sensitive, it's, uh, I don't think I can have anyone saying I'm not politically incorrect in using it, whereas maybe there are the other jokes that someone could get offended by. Because in jokes, you often take a risk, you know. That's, that's of course you <laughs> so, Here we go. This is two couples walking down the street. And the two men are uh, a bit in front. It's two married couples, men and, men and wives, so heterosexual couples. Um, <laughs> maybe that's politically incorrect to say anyway. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the two men are the two husbands are in front. The two uh, and the two women actually, sorry, the, the two women are in front chatting, and the two men are behind chatting. And one of the men turns to the other man, the man who's next to him, and says, "How's your week been? Anything really lovely this week?" And this is pre-COVID. You'll understand in a second because he says, "Oh, I went to a delightful restaurant. Um, we went to a delightful restaurant last night. We had a beautiful meal, lovely ambiance." And I just couldn't fault it. It was a five-star rating, best meal I've had in, in years, best, best evening out. And the other man says, oh, that sounds fantastic. It sounds really good. What's the name of the restaurant? And the original man says, oh, um, 
what was the name of what was the name? What's that plant that has a, a red petals and a stalk with thorns on? And he says, "What you mean a rose?" He says, "That's it, rose." What was the name of that restaurant we went to last night? <laughs> That's not incorrect. That's you know the only the only time the only time I kind of interfered almost with a joke was when the person who's who was about to tell it said, "Can we tell jokes about blondes?" And I was like, mm. <laughs> "Why don't you just you know pick scientists?" <laughs> so we uh, we did the joke and scientists. Well, uh, awesome. <laughs> My jokes are usually um, less funny than this. <laughs> Come on, see, tonight's your night. Tonight's the night. <laughs> well, okay, uh, let me think. Um, actually, I had two in mind today. Ah, no. Do, do you laugh at Chuck Norris jokes? At whose jokes? <laughs> oh, you don't even know who Chuck Norris is? Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris. Chuck, not... Chuck Norris. Okay, then I'm not going to tell it. <laughs> Well, actually, he's like a team, you know, big guy who fights with everything and can, you know, create bombs with his like pinky finger. Um, so he erases entire countries just by himself. Uh, this figure uh, of, you know, Sylvester Stallone, uh, a team, and all of it all together. This one guy, you have to check him out. There are like, I think, five thousand Chuck Norris jokes. Do you have Alexa at home? Um, do I at home? Alexa? Uh, Alexa, I do have Alexa, but we don't, I've given up on Alexa. I don't Yeah, well, but one, one thing she's really good at is telling Chuck Norris jokes. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm just, I'm just hearing from my uh, engine room that I should, <laughs> I should Get tell another there. joke. <laughs> okay. So the how many, so the question the is, <laughs> the question is, how many sit-ups does Chuck Norris does do? I have no idea how many sit-ups does Chuck Norris do. All of them. <laughs> That's good. I like that. It reminds me, you know, it's Spencer Stewart doing more and more leadership development and coaching people, and that reminds me of the one coaching joke, which is how many coaches, business coaches, executive coaches, does it take to change a light bulb? Oh my God, how many? It's one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I think that can work for therapy as well. If we can, we can probably use that for therapy. Really cool. You know, I don't know whether you can hear it, but my engine room in the living room is cracking up totally <laughs> right now. Well, thank you so much, William. This was delightful. And here is my food. I'm going to take a picture of it. And here is the, you know, yogurt. You have. I mean, it, it doesn't. It doesn't look like something. <laughs> Tell me what yours was. It doesn't look. It doesn't really look like, uh, you know, edible food. But, but it's actually really good. Is it yogurt? Yogurt this is yogurt. Meat. Yeah, this is yogurt with uh, cucumbers and garlic and some salt. Okay, I'm just rearranging my pancakes before I show you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, they're looking <laughs> awesome. Ta da! <laughs> Voila! <laughs> awesome. Oh, uh, William, please stay on the line. I'm going to be saying goodnight to people who uh, were with us tonight. And um, I would like to thank you once again for taking the time, staying up late for your, uh, you know, uh, daily daily practices. And um, I think this was really, really interesting and uh, some of the best jokes I heard actually in this show. Thank you. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining me for uh, tonight's episode at the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. We had banana pancakes, we had some garlic yogurt, um, and I will be taking pictures and posting them. Um, they're very easy recipes. Entrepreneurs eat simple. Um, because you know we were quick eaters probably. I'm hoping that you guys are going to be joining me tomorrow again at the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. Um, and um, looking forward to seeing you. And thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.